Hello and welcome to the latest of our University of St Andrews Scotland's Future Series podcasts. And today we've got a really special guest, Lesia Vasilienko. Welcome to St Andrews. Um, Lesia is a member of parliament from Ukraine and also president of the Women's Bureau in the Interparliamentary Union, as well as being a delegate to the Council of Europe. Lesia, you're so welcome in St Andrews and you're so welcome to be joining us here today. Oh, thank you for this welcome. It's amazing to be here and the weather is very generous with me, I understand. Well, that's it. No, it's a nice day. For those of you, um, for those of you who are listening, we've got the good fortune to be recording this on a beautiful sunny St Andrew's Day that many of you will be well aware of and we're overlooking um, St Salvatore's and the Quad at the moment and it's beautiful. Um, Lesia, thanks for joining us. It's so important um, to have you here for us today and we're, we're, we're grateful that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to be here. Can you just tell us a little bit about what the current situation is in, in Ukraine and why for anybody listening to the podcast or watching, why should we continue to care? Why does it continue to be important? Uh, because it's a war in Ukraine. It's a continuing war that uh, has been on since February 2014, but that has escalated to absolutely unprecedented levels this February, February 24th, 2022. And when we are talking about a war, it's uh, a situation which touches upon everyone. The country, Ukraine, which is uh, a victim of this war and which is fighting physically, and also all of the countries of the region where Ukraine is, Europe, and of the family of democratic and freedom-loving countries of this global family that Ukraine is part of. That war touches upon every single one of us. And you think this is something that is of a critical importance, even as we sit here on the, the other side of Europe, this is something that's affecting us and we should care about. And is that something that you're picking up on your visits to the UK? Well, you know, uh, I understand what you mean, because we're sitting here in, on this uh, beautiful day in, in Scotland, far away from everything. There's no air raid sirens. There's, uh, you know, life is normal. It's a quiet student town. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, people are dying uh, in Ukraine. Uh, people cannot go to sleep in their own beds. Uh, with the certitude that they will wake up alive in the morning. And uh, mass graves are being found not so far away from here, just a three hour flight normally, but of course there are no flights to Ukraine, to anywhere in Ukraine. Um, torture chambers are being found all across Ukraine. And this is, I, I'm talking about Europe here, and yeah. I'm talking about the 21st century. Uh, and again, I come back to St. Andrews. This is, uh, this is the university grounds, this is where uh, young minds are, are being forged to defend values, to defend yeah. freedom, democracy, to defend human rights. And I think it would be in the least bit hypocritical if we were to sit here and not give a damn about all these people who are dying in Ukraine for those very concepts of freedom, democracy, human rights and liberties. But you're really, it's really important you pick up on those values and I want to return to those in a moment. But before I do that, Obviously, history is something that we should be learning from. Now, this brutal war, this war of aggression towards your country, and your homeland, these crimes that you've rightly identified, mass graves, the murdering of, of, of civilians that is taking place as we speak is appalling and is horrifying. But can you talk to me a little bit about the history that led up to this? I mean. This really shouldn't have come as a surprise to anybody. I mean, anybody who's followed Putin's wars of aggression, be it towards his own people in Chechnya and elsewhere, the wars in Syria, um, the wars in Georgia, and now Ukraine. And actually, the war in Ukraine didn't start on the 24th of February. It started in 2014. Can you talk to us a little bit about the history and what are the lessons that we should have been learning and those lessons that we didn't learn? Do not appease dictators. This is the easiest lesson, and this lesson should have been learned by humanity in general throughout the centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, the world went on appeasing Putin and appeasing uh, authoritarian Russia. Why? Uh, well, the answer is economics and uh, the short-term economic benefits that, that were being collected from that appeasement. Uh, the gas was cheap, 
But of course, that also meant a certain addiction to Russia's uh, energy resources and the dependence on Russia. Mm. Uh, the business deals were good. They were bringing in the dollars, the pounds, the euros, whatever. Um, but of course, behind that, human rights were slipping and yeah. freedom of speech was slipping. And I think that um, today the, there is, I wouldn't say blame, but there is actually a contribution that was made by the West who was reluctant to introduce sanctions in the time when Chechnya was happening, in yeah. the time when Georgia was happening, mm -hmm. and in the time when Ukraine first happened in February 2014. Well, we're now sitting, I think, today when we're recording this is the 16th anniversary of the murder, for example, of Anna Politskaya, the, the um, campaign journalist who uncovered many of these crimes in, in Chechnya. This has been going on for a long time. So, you know, you talked about the dirty money, the easy deals, let's touch upon disinformation because that's something that pollutes and corrupts democratic discourse um, ac across Europe and actually further afield as well. We can't undo history, but we can learn from it. So do you want to tell me a little bit more? What would you, if, if what, what, what is your message, not just to our students, but to the world outside about the kind of lessons that we must take from these failures? And let's, let's, let's call them failures because they were failures. That, that, that took place in the West, in Western Europe and in elsewhere, elsewhere over the past 20 years. I'm with you on looking into the future 100%. Yeah. And we definitely need to look to the past mm -hmm. to be able to pave a better future. And we need to call things for what they are. Uh, yes, mistakes were made. Uh, we can correct them now. The way to correct them now is to not fall into Putin's trap. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot uh, appease dictators anymore. Every time we appease Putin and Russia, we give hope to uh, North Korea, to Iran, to other totalitarian states out there that they can get away with international crimes, with murder, with atrocities, torture. I don't think, again, this is the kind of world that we want to live mm -hmm. in ourselves and the kind of world that we want to leave to our children. So no appeasement there, no ceding of territories to Russia. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk about that. What if Ukraine just signs off on, I don't know, these new annexations, for example. Yeah. Well, uh, how about we go back to Crimea in 2014? Uh, Russia annexed Crimea. And not much was done in the eight years by the international community to help Ukraine get it back. Actually, in the uh, in the cool wars, in the mm. backstage, everybody was telling Ukraine just forget about Crimea. Let's mm. we're we're happy to focus on uh, the Donetsk, Luhansk, the so-called Donbass yeah. region, but forget about Crimea. Mm -hmm. And and Putin will back off. Did he back off? No. 24th of February, uh, at five in the morning, I woke up from a phone call saying to me, in half an hour, there's a parliamentary sitting, we're w voting in martial law because the Russian missiles are already flying over Ukraine. That happened five o'clock in the morning. Can you tell I us got us the a call at that? five in the morning, yes. Can you tell us a wee bit about that moment? Uh, the missiles started flying over mm -hmm. Ukraine at three o'clock in the morning, uh, but this I learned later. Mm -hmm. At five o'clock in the morning, I was happily asleep. I was preparing to go into parliament because it was a parliamentary week. Um, we were all expecting that something was about to happen just yeah. a couple of days before we voted in a, an emergency state across the country, but we weren't yet voting the martial law. Mm -hmm. But at five o'clock in the morning, um, a colleague of my husband's, an ex-colleague of my husband's calls us. And I know this is something very strange because like she would never call us. She would never call us so early in the morning. And immediately I grab my own phone and I see that already. That's it. It's exploding. It's everywhere. All the, mm -hmm. all the political party chats, all the parliamentary chats on WhatsApp, on this, mm -hmm. all the social media that we use. They are, they are already full of messages. Mm -hmm. My colleague, who's also my very dear friend, calls me up, she lives two blocks away from me, says, okay, in half an hour, we're picking you up and we're going to parliament, yeah. we need to vote. And uh, from then it was just automatic. I remember that only in parliament, I was approached by another colleague saying, 
oh my god you you look so good you have your makeup in place you have your hair in place i didn't even realize this i was doing this automatically on just yeah. on complete autopilot at eight in the morning we voted for the martial law in the parliament mm -hmm. And after that, uh, we were all sent off to the central police station to pick up our, we our weapons because we were notified very clearly and explicitly that every single member of parliament, every single acting member of parliament is on Russia's kill list. So you were on a kill list. And can you tell us about, because of course there was some media um, with, with, with pictures of you with your weapon, but like other colleagues as well. Tell us a little bit about how that felt to go from being a civilian in a parliament, I've been in parliament, you know, there's a distinction um, there. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that felt? Autopilot mode. Autopilot mode. <laughs> in, okay. a, in a very short, concise way, it's autopilot mode. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't really think about what was happening. You were just doing things that you were recommended to do. Another thing that I was recommended to do as well, all of my colleagues, was not to stay in the apartment that was in any way linked to you or in the house that was any way linked to you. So for about a month uh, after 24th of February, I would be going into my own home, into my own apartment mm -hmm. for no longer than 15 minutes just to get the essentials, just to yeah. get a change of clothes and mm -hmm. that's it. Uh, for that month, we were all walking around with our PMs, with our AKs ready to go. Uh, now it's a whole other story. Your AK's Kalashnikov yes. weapon, yeah. Yes, now it's a whole other story about how we were expected to use them. Because, mm -hmm. uh, well, actually most people like me, they uh, never had the, the need to use the weapon. So are, you, are you weapons, were you weapons trained at that point? Of course not. No. There was no way to train us. The, uh, the, the, the guys handing out these weapons at the police station, they were just, you know, also on autopilot, but they were looking at us with these yeah. huge eyes because we're giving you weapons. We're not giving you enough bullets for them uh, and we're not giving you uh, any training. So uh, after you've been issued with them, it's your own uh, responsibility what you're going to do. Now, uh, I came home and uh, to my, my husband's parents and uh, my father-in-law actually saw all of this and he said, right, now go and cut your nails and we're going to <laughs> teach you uh, how to make good use of this. Because your father-in-law had some experience yes, of yes, doing he it. Yes, so yes, he was in the army back So in the nails day. were cut. Yes, and, and the, the weapons were learned how to be taken apart, put back together and cleaned and, and all of that. Well, let me take you forward from that moment. There'd been, to be in a situation whereby you are arming your members of parliament for their own self-defense, just like the policeman that you talk about, whose duty it is on autopilot to hand out those weapons. That speaks to me of a, an accumulative failure over 20 years that we touched upon, a disastrous failure that's costing lives in Ukraine right now. And you're right, it seems like a world away here when we're sitting at the University of St. Andrews, but you touched upon values earlier on. So what role does education have? What role does the universities have, you know, in terms of debating and discussing these values in, 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 in trying to build a better future and, and, and build from where we are now? I'll put it this way. Another yeah. aspect of Russia's aggression against Ukraine mm -hmm. is the humanitarian blow that Putin is causing to Ukraine, mm -hmm. to Ukraine's youth and to Ukraine's future. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this war is taking away the most precious thing that we Ukrainians treasure, the right to education. Mm -hmm. For uh, generations, uh, you, the parents thought that giving your child a good education at the best university that you can afford mm -hmm. was the goal of their life. Yeah. Because it's something that can never be taken away mm -hmm. from you. This is something that corruption cannot take away mm -hmm. from you. This is something that oligarchs can't take away of you. This is something that uh, street gangsters can't take away from you. This is something that stays with you. And uh, Putin right now is taking it away from us. How mm -hmm. is he doing this? Um, the schools are not safe. Yeah. They're, uh, the only uh, classes that go to school would be up to uh, year five. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Which how, how old is that? Year five. Uh, well, this is uh, sort of nine, ten years so old. So nine, kids. ten years old. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, because these kids are not yet trained to sit in front of the mm -hmm. screen all day, screen all day, and they cannot do online education. Um, the rest of the school children, they uh, have online education. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the bomb shelters in the schools do not have the capacity to fit in 400, 600 kids at a time. Yeah. So we have to divide them up into, into shifts, so to speak. So education at school age cannot take place because there is insufficient room in a bomb shelter. Exactly. Because lessons can, can be disrupted because there's an air raid. And what about, I mean, that's devastating and there'll be consequences of that going forward. And tell me about what role then in terms of discussing and debating the values. What should universities be doing? You met earlier on today with a number of Ukrainian students. Do you want to reflect on the discussions you had with them, their hopes and fears, and how do they and how do others who are involved in universities make a contribution to, to building that future? I mean, these kids, the Ukrainian kids here in this university, they are uh, they are amazing. They are Ukraine's future. They are Ukraine's hope. And I'm so happy that they have the chance to be here in safety and the chance to be doing this thinking of uh, and the chance to be the ambassadors of Ukraine in this mm -hmm. great facilities that is St. Andrews. But at the same time, of course, their thoughts are with Ukraine. Their thoughts are with their younger siblings who go through this wartime education system, which, which uh, we just talked about. And um, these kids, they are more privileged than other Ukrainian university mm -hmm. students because universities in Ukraine, pretty much the same as high schools, they are all online. Yeah. There is no capacity uh, for students to be risking their lives by going and getting an on offline education. And it's not just about education. It's about the opportunity you have to have debates, to have discussions, to have social bonds. That's going to be missing. Mm -hmm. Essentially, generations of Ukrainians are now being brought up and are growing up without the necessary social skills, mm -hmm. without adequate education skills. So wh what could universities do like St. Andrews, like other universities around the UK and beyond? Open up more programs for, for Ukrainian kids, open up more scholarships, uh, more opportunities for them to be here in safety, at least for the next school year, maybe another one, mm -hmm. uh, for them to, to be sharing their experience because they can bring a lot to the table by telling it like it is and what it feels like to live in a war and what it feels like to really physically de defend those values about which Aristotle and Socrates was writing about. Well, I'm really glad you said that because from our own reflections, the Ukrainian students who are here, we're proud to have them here and they enrich our university um, as, as, as well. Um, and I take your message that to have more of those spaces is, is an appeal today. Can I just take one, as, as one final question? We've got the, Ukraine, the flag of Ukraine proudly flying above the, the university today. But of course, like everything, life moves on. People have got their lives um, to, to go on with. But if, if anybody's listening to this today, what's the message that you want them to take away from your visit today? What's the message that you'd like to tell them or remind them about, yes, the lessons we've learned and about the future as well? Well, that flag flying high, I must say, it warms my heart. Like every time I go abroad and I see a Ukrainian flag, it, it just gives that little message of support. And it just gives that little message that there's a family here or this institution supports Ukrainians. And this is something that I take back home to the constituencies around Ukraine when I say that, oh, I've been to, to the UK or to France or Germany or wherever is my next uh, sort of diplomatic mission. And I say that the people there are standing by you and are supporting you. And uh, to the people in all of these countries abroad and here in Scotland especially, I say thank you. Thank you for welcoming the Ukrainians, for opening up your doors and your hearts to, to our families, mainly women and children really, who are fleeing the war and who really need to be safe so that they stay alive and so that they can come back and rebuild Ukraine that is being devastated by Russia. And uh, for the future, what I'd like to say, well, the war goes on. And uh, it's easy to forget it because our brain is only human. It gets used to things, it gets adapted. This is how we humans survive. But we are all grown-ups mm -hmm. and we've all been through this in 2014, 15, 16. 
We know how our brain works by now. So let's draw a lesson from that and let's take this situation in full awareness and every day that we wake up in the morning, let's call on ourselves and on our brain to do that little bit more for Ukraine. Maybe it's a tweet, maybe it's a Facebook post reminding people that uh, the war in Ukraine is still going on and reminding people that the efforts still need to be mobilized, reminding governments that the weapons still need to be sent and the sanctions need to be reinforced. Uh, maybe it's just something little that you can do for your local Ukrainians that had to leave their homes uh, in the hope of staying alive and one day being able to come back home, home to their Ukraine. Thank you, Alessia. Thank you so much for joining us in St. Andrews. And we look forward to welcoming you back in the future. Thank, thank you. you. It's thanks. been a pleasure. No, thank you. Thank you for listening today.